Hello, what's the difference in curing the primer adhesive and the looting composite when you're placing a veneer versus curing the primer adhesive and the direct composite when you're placing a composite directly on a tooth? I'm going to talk about this case. I've placed veneers on this young man's maxillary anterior teeth and bonded the chipped incisal edges of the mandibular anterior teeth. Now, one of the big differences is in veneers versus direct composite is you can lengthen the teeth and you can widen the teeth and you can correct a lot of things with veneers that you can't correct, in my opinion, with bond direct bonded composite because the veneer is stronger. In other words, you can add a little length to the teeth and you can certainly widen the teeth and it's it's much more durable with a veneer. The other thing about a veneer is the veneer is not going to stain permanently. It may get a little coffee stain or something like that on the veneer, but it can be polished off. Whereas the, the direct bonded composite absorbs the stain and it's much harder to remove. And most of the times you can't remove the stain. So the other thing is you can't lengthen the teeth with bonded composite. You can see I've changed a lot of things with these veneers, but with the bonded composite, I, I really can't make the tooth any longer than the longest part of the tooth. Like in this case, I can't make this tooth this length with a bonded composite because that's in what's called the envelope of function of the mandible. It means a movement the mandible goes through so if you make it longer, this is the person's grinding pattern, and they're probably going to knock it off. So with bonded composite, I don't ever try to lengthen the teeth any longer than the longest part of the, ex the presenting tooth. These are just befores and afters of this case. So initially, I prepared the maxillary anterior teeth and bicuspids for veneers. This case is going to be presented in the library of dentistrymasterclasses.com. So the first thing we do with veneers, we etch the teeth and then we rinse the etch off with ice cold water. Now, the thing I discovered by accident years ago is that 38% phosphoric acid is a fantastic hemostatic agent. Look at the bleeding around the gums that's scabbed with that 38% phosphoric acid. So I'm leaving it on the teeth 45 seconds to a minute and also on the gums. It doesn't damage the gum in any, the gingival tissue in any way. And it is a fabulous hemostatic agent. So I'm, and I'm rinsing it off with ice cold water in a plastic water bottle. You don't want to use your air water syringe under pressure or you'll elicit bleeding again. So just ice cold water. Then I'm placing the primer adhesive on the tooth side of the veneer. And it's very important that you blow it off. Why do you blow it off? Because the primer adhesive has an acetone carrier. And if you leave the leave it on the tooth in bulk or on the veneer in bulk, that acetone can diminish the bond strength. So both with veneers and with direct composites, you always want to blow off the primer adhesive. The difference in seating a veneer versus direct composite is when you're placing a direct composite, after you blow the primer adhesive off, you cure the primer adhesive. If you want to eliminate sensitivity from teeth, cure the primer adhesive prior to placing your direct composite. Whereas with the veneer, you don't cure anything, primer adhesive or looting composite, until all the veneers are placed with my technique. Now, some people place veneers one veneer at a time and finish them. I don't do that for a bunch of reasons. Number one, the veneer might swim just a little bit, so the adjacent veneers don't, the interproximal contacts of the adjacent veneers are not perfect. The other thing is, if you cure the looting composite on a single veneer and then finish it, you're probably going to get gingival bleeding. 
So I don't want that getting on the adjacent teeth. So I place all the veneers at one time. So the big part here is blow all the primer adhesive off until it doesn't move. And I've placed it on all the veneers I'm seeding. Then you put them under these orange, co orange covers to prevent them from curing. Then I'm going to place the primer adhesive on the teeth. And I'm going to put a copious amount on. I'm going to really soak them with primer adhesive and then blow it off onto a 2x2. Two two. Now, always place a 2x2 two two on the tooth when you're blowing it off so it doesn't get all over the tissue. Now, remember, I've already placed primer adhesive on the tooth side of the veneer and blown it off till nothing wiggles. I'll say that again. I've already placed primer adhesive on the tooth side of the veneer and blown off the primer adhesive until nothing wiggles. I've done the same thing on the teeth. I've not cured anything. I don't pick up a curing light until all the veneers are seated. Let me say that again. I don't touch a pure curing light until all the veneers have been seated. The squirting the looting composite, the filled resin onto the veneer, and I'm seeding all the veneers. I'm wiping off a little bit on the lingual or the paldal of the veneers to be sure everything is set. And then I push into place one more time so that that little bit of excess looting composite squirts out on the paldal surface. Now they're all in place, and at this point I take a curing light and I cure them very briefly. Like, I start the curing light on the left side and go beep 1001, 1002 on the palatal. And then I do the same thing on the facial, beep 1001, 1002. So the, the looting composite is not set real hard. It's set kind of like crunchy snow because, remember, you never want to remove the excess looting composite in the unset stage. You don't ever want to wipe it off. You want it to break off. Otherwise, if you wipe it off, you're going to get some suck back in that micro gap between the veneer and the tooth. There's always a little bit of micro gap between any restoration and the tooth. It may only be 25 microns or it might be 500 micron microns if the veneer crown doesn't fit very well. Bacteria is 8 microns in diameter. So if you wipe off unset looting composite or crown and bridge cement, cement, if you wipe it off in the flowable stage, doesn't it make sense you're going to get some pullback or suck back out of that micro gap? So there's going to be a void in the micro gap. So you want to cure these veneers initially just a second or two to get that crunchy snow hardness so that you can peel the excess looting composite off. You don't ever want to wipe it off. See how quick that was? Then you use the back edge of a scaler and push down and it just peels off. Now if you do this, that micro gap between the veneer and the tooth is like a sandwich with the looting composite being the lettuce, the meat, the tomato, and cheese. It's filled. It's not, there's no void between the veneer and the crown. It's filled completely with the looting composite. Just chips right off. Then, once you've removed the excess looting composite, generally, you're going to have a little bit left, floss between the veneers. You're going to cure the veneers 60 seconds on each side, both the facial and the palatal. That's once you've removed most of the looting composite with the back edge of a scaler and you floss between the veneers. Then you're going to come back and what I do is on every veneer, I place one curing light on the facial and one on the palo and I cure them 60 seconds per tooth. Now that's probably significant overcure, but you can't overcure composite. You can undercure, so I want to be sure that they're completely cured. So I go 60 seconds on each side with each veneer. Then I come back with this 12 fluted, fluted Brazilier carbide burr, and in the polishing direction with the burr, you know, if you pull towards you, 
the burr cuts. If you push, go away from you in the, with a handpiece, the burr polishes. I'm removing any little bits of excess looting composite that are still on there. Now they're completely set. Another hot tip is take the square end of, a, of an amalgam carver and wipe it on the facial surface of the veneers and it removes any little bits of adhesive or excess looting composite that may be on the facial surface. Then I'm going to use a large fine chamfer diamond and remove the excess looting composite from the palatal surface. Floss. Of course the gingival tissue is going to be irritated right now because you're polishing and flossing and tell the patient it's going to look like hell for about a day or two. And don't let that deter the patient from brushing and flossing their teeth. They're not doing causing the irritation brushing and flossing their teeth, the gingival tissue is irritated because the patient hasn't been able to floss while the provisionals were on the teeth because they were all connected together. And now from the, the polishing and the flossing, the gingival tissue will be irritated for a few days. But after a few days, they'll look just like normal. Then once I've polished off the excess looting composite and adjusted the occlusion, I'm going to use Shofu rubber wheels and polish the margins and the palatal surface of the tooth. I want this wheel to be turning from the veneer to the tooth in this direction. You don't want to polish from the tooth to the veneer. You want to go from the veneer to the tooth. Now we're going to place the direct composite on the incisal edges of the chipped mandibular anterior teeth. I don't like large direct composites. I personally don't like interproximal direct composites if it's a large class two. I'll place them directly, say I'm doing a crown on a adjacent tooth and I've got access all and there's a little decay on the mesial surface of the adjacent tooth. I'll place a small composite in that on that mesial surface or if it's a smaller occlusal composite that's great the problem with direct composites or any composite or any filling for that matter if they get large is the coefficient of thermal expansion of a composite is 75 the coefficient of thermal expansion of tooth is 11 so coefficient of thermal expansion in it, you know, means how much something expands and contracts when exposed to hot and cold. The larger the composite filling, the more coefficient of thermal expansion differential comes into play. So if you've got a large composite filling in a tooth, say a large MO or an MOD, and that patient drinks a lot of cold water or a lot of hot coffee, that filling is going like this while the tooth is going like this and the margins are going to pull away and it's going to leak. The other issue I've got with, with large composites, especially interproximal composites, is it's really hard to get a good sealed margin because of curricular fluid and just access. So this is a good place to place a direct composite because they're smaller. Now, if you try to place a direct composite on a worn or chipped incisal edge and you don't cut a little trench in the dentin of the tooth, kind of like a foxhole, to protect that composite, the patient's going to knock it off just like they knocked off their natural tooth structure. So you're not damaging the tooth. This is a tiny little round burr, and you're just creating a little trench to hold that composite. And these are very durable. Now, it's imperative that the patient wear a night guard. If they don't wear a night guard, they're going to grind it off at night when they're sleeping, just like they ground off their natural teeth. So you're going to be a very frustrated dentist if you're, number one, placing these composites on the incisal edge of a chipped tooth and you don't create that little trench in the tooth and especially if the patient doesn't have a night guard because you're they're going to be coming back saying you must not be a very good dentist you just put that on a week ago and it's already come off well you haven't protected it by having a little trench in the tooth to protect it and the patient wearing a night guard i i wouldn't place these personally if the patient doesn't wear a night guard because 
I don't want the patient's problem to become my problem. And when I do place them, I'm going to say, I guarantee these until you walk out the front door. As a prominent dentist once told me, there's nothing you can do as a dentist that a patient can't undo if they try hard enough. So I want the patient to have some skin in the game. They're the one that doesn't like the looks of these chipped teeth. I don't have a dog in that fight. So what are our options? Either veneer them or place the composite. But if you place the composite, and the patient's not careful if they bite hard things with their front teeth, if they don't wear their night guard, they're probably going to chip them off. And you don't want to be replacing them for free all the time because the patient is not taking care of a restoration that you placed as well as it can be placed, but their habits undid you. So we're going to etch these areas for about dentin. You typically etch for 15 to 20 seconds enamel there's not really a limit on how much you can etch it. Normally, I'll etch enamel for 45 seconds to a minute. If you've got dentin and enamel, etch the enamel first and then place dentin on it. Now, we're not worried about bleeding here, so I'm just rinsing that off with my air water syringe. Then in this case, I'm isolating with 2 by 2s Now, some of you will say if you don't isolate with a rubber dam, it's not good practice. Well, as you know, if you've watched my videos, I use my rubber dam technique on most procedures, even many extractions. In this case, though, it's such a, a pain to place that rubber dam that the key is not the rubber dam. What's the key? The objective is isolation so the patient's not breathing on it. Well, I contend that in a case like this, you can isolate well if you pack these two-by-twos in the mouth. There's, they're not going to get any breath on the restoration. So again, you saw me blowing that off onto a two-by-two. Two. All the excess primer adhesive. I blow it off onto a two-by-two. Two. I don't want to blow it off onto the tissue because then they've got primer adhesive set up on their tissue. So place a two-by-two two right over the tooth and blow it off onto that two-by-two two by two until nothing wiggles. Then I'm going to floss between any teeth that have contacts. Then, this is the kicker. With direct composite, cure the primer adhesive once you've blown off the excess. I'm going to say that again. With any direct composite, on the incisal, facial incisal, occlusal, anytime I'm placing a direct composite, I blow the primer adhesive off onto the two by two and then I cure it. You only have to cure it for about four seconds. Whereas with a veneer, we don't cure anything until everything is placed, until all the veneers are placed. Then we cure the primer adhesive that's been blown off the direct looting composite once the veneer is on the teeth all at the same time. But with a direct composite, you blow off the excess primer adhesive onto a two by two and you cure it for four to five seconds. That'll get rid of sensitivity. So then I place my flowable composite. Now you may want to use highly filled composite. In these cases, I usually use flowable just because it wets better than a highly filled composite, and it's almost as strong. Remember, I'm not going to do these restorations if a patient doesn't want to wear a night guard. I tell patients that a night guard is like brakes on your car, and if somebody says they don't want to wear a night guard, I say, great, you're like an annuity plan for my practice. We'll be seeing you all the time with broken teeth, chipped teeth, cracked teeth, you know, you think about how much of your dental practice is because of patients grinding their teeth at night when they're sleeping. Probably a pretty good portion. So my daughters got a night guard when they'd stopped growing at about 16. And I told them, if you'll wear this the rest of your life, your teeth will be this length the rest of your life unless you're in an accident. Because most of the time when people have shortened their teeth, it's from bruxism, clenching at night when they're sleeping. So most of the patients in my practice have a properly made centric relation occlusal night guard. 
I'm flowing this on. Remember, the primer adhesive has been blown off and cured, and I can't make this direct composite any longer than the longest part of the tooth when the patient presented. Then I'm going to cure the filled resin, and I'm going to cure the, as I said, I cure the primer adhesive for about five seconds, and I'm going to cure the filled resin about 60 seconds. That's probably overcure, but I want to be sure it's cured. Then I'm going to polish it with a show food disc and this 12 fluted or 30 fluted carbide burr. Check the occlusion. You don't want the four incisor teeth to contact hard. You want to be able to pull shim stock between the four anterior teeth in the alert feeding position when the patient's sitting straight up. You want the primary contacts to be from the cuspid to the mesial of the first, of the first molar. You can watch my video on occlusion. You don't want the second molar or the anterior teeth ever to be the, pr the first contacts. You want the, first, the hardest contacts to be cuspid to first molar. So this is before and after. Veneers on the maxillary anterior teeth back to the second bicuspid. Bonded composite on the lower anterior teeth to repair these chipped areas. The other thing about bonded composite, it makes this look better because the dentin is often brown and it just perks them up. We're going to place veneers on this gentleman's lower anterior teeth at some point. That's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time. Take your practice to the top tier. Subscribe to DentistryMasterclasses.com for an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos, plus many complete comprehensive cases and many very important articles. New cases are added weekly, only $20 per month. Subscribe now.